Yesterday I ended up uh, talking about evolutionary arms races, and I'm going to begin today by talking about a particularly spectacular example of an evolutionary arms race. Uh, that's the arms race between cuckoos and their hosts. And I'm going to talk about it because it's a wonderful opportunity to make a variety of points, general points, about evolution and about biology generally. Uh, much of what I say is derived from Nick Davies, um, who's our leading authority on cuckoos, and that is his book there. Uh, the, the background biology, many of you may already know it. Cuckoos are birds that never uh, build their own nests. They're brood parasites. There are quite a lot of other brood parasites as well as cuckoos. In other words, the habit has evolved convergently in different groups of birds. That's a very common <coughs> phenomenon in evolution, that things happen independently in different groups. For example, in American cowbirds. Uh, but the European cuckoo is a particularly spectacular example. They don't build their own nests. They don't pay the costs, the economic costs, and that's another general point, that economic costs are vitally important to all animals. They don't pay the economic costs of a long incubation period, a nest building period, and, uh, and feeding of the, of the young. That's all done by the host. So the cuckoo dumps an egg in the nest of another species of bird and relies upon that other species of bird to uh, incubate the egg and to feed the young when it emerges. Um, that means that the cuckoo is able to go away and lay another egg in somebody else's nest and another one in somebody else's nest because it doesn't have to stop in order to do the incubation or the feeding. The female cuckoo is seen to stalk a victim for a number of days before eventually returning to attack the nest. When she finally does attack the nest, she waits until uh, the host uh, bird is absent. Then she swoops quickly in, removes an egg from the nest, and then lays her own single egg, and then disappears, never to return. Cuckoo eggs hatch very quickly. They hatch more quickly than the eggs of their hosts, which means that the baby cuckoo hatches first. And that's important, because the first thing it does when it hatches is to perform a diabolical act. It, one by one, tosses the other eggs, the unhatched eggs, out of the nest. And it has a special hollow in its back in which the egg fits. And you see there, it's backing up the side of the nest to toss the egg so it remains as the only inhabitant of the nest. Uh, the cuckoo um, has a supernormal, that's another of these general points, a supernormal gape. Um, all young birds that are fed in the nest by the parent have a gape which is conspicuous and appealing to the parent. In this case it's bright red uh, and this is actually not a cuckoo, this is a cowbird, which is the American um, uh, convergent um, root parasite. But the cuckoo has had a similar... <coughs> All ba baby birds that, that are brought up in the, in the nest have this conspicuous gape. And it seems that the parent has a, a kind of built-in tendency to, whenever it sees a, a bright red gape like that, to drop food into it. So, uh, this is my next lesson um, from this case. Uh, the, none of these birds should be thought of as knowing what they're doing or why they're doing it. Think of them as kind of little clockwork robots uh, which are pre-programmed by their genes to perform certain actions. So the brain is pre-programmed by the genes working through the processes of embryology if you see a bright red gape in, in your nest, drop food into it. That's what the cuckoo exploits. The parent host bird doesn't know it's a cuckoo. It doesn't know anything. We, at least we, there's no reason to assume that it, that it knows anything. It's just got this bit of clockwork in, it, in its brain, which says, if you see a bright red gape in your nest, drop food into it. That's what the cuckoo um, 
exploits. Cuckoos actually have a supernormal, that was the word I used a moment ago, a supernormal red gape. That means it's even more attractive, even more appealing to a parent bird than the parent bird's own chicks. Uh, and it's so appealing that there are various anecdotes of um, cuckoos being in a, in a nest and diverting other birds who don't even own the nest flying by. They suddenly, they're flying by and they suddenly see this bright red gape. And so they swerve to, off to the side and drop food into it. That's how mechanical it is. That's how automatic it is. So you can imagine that it's if, it's a, if it's in the bird's own nest, it's doubly appealing. So now the cuckoo, the baby cuckoo, is the sole occupant of the nest and it gets all the food that's going, all the food that would otherwise have gone to, say, three nestlings of the host's own chicks. Um, and it grows monstrously big. Uh, baby birds go on being fed even when they're no longer sitting in the nest, when they're sitting on a perch outside the nest. Um, and that's normal, but what is not normal is that an adult wren would feed a monster like that. Once again, this ram's home, that's a quote from, anybody know? Chaucer. Um, uh, the wren doesn't know what it's doing. It's the, it's the clockwork mechanism in the brain which says, the creature that you've been feeding in your nest, you go on feeding until it leaves. And you go on feeding even when it's palpably obvious that it, that's not a baby wren. <laughs> <coughs> now let's go back to um, pre the previous um, stage when the, when, the egg, <coughs> when the egg is in the nest. Um, that is um, a reed warbler's nest, and you see two reed warbler eggs and one cuckoo egg. The, the adult cuckoo will have removed one reed warbler egg already when it, when it visited the nest. It laid its own egg, and you can see that the cuckoo egg is bigger. Um, but otherwise, it is a remarkably good mimic of the reed warbler's eggs. And one presumes that if it wasn't a good mimic, the reed warbler adult would spot it and uh, toss it out. So natural selection, this is this, it appears that natural selection has worked on the speckling and the patterning, the colour of the cuckoo egg, to make it mimic. Remember yesterday I showed you insect mimics. Indeed, you can see some more here. These are insects which mimic um, leaves. These are leaf insects. Um, Mimicry is a very common phenomenon. Natural selection is extremely good at producing near-perfect mimicry. And in this case, it's produced excellent mimicry of reed warbler eggs. <coughs> there is a nest of a different species, the brambling. Um, and again, you see egg mimicry. There's the cuckoo egg. You see it's bigger than the brambling eggs, but the speckle, speckling pattern is essentially identical to the brambling. There is meadow pipit. Meadow pipit lays blacker eggs. There's the cuckoo egg, and there are the meadow pipit eggs. Once again, the cuckoo egg is bigger, but the mimicry is very good. Now, there may be something bothering you about this, because the cuckoos <coughs> parasitize meadow pipits and bramblings and reed warblers and lots of other species of bird. They're all the same species of cuckoo. They're an interbreeding species. They're a, they're a breeding population of cuckoos. How the hell does one population of cuckoos manage to produce a different egg depending upon which species it's parasitizing. So that's a puzzle that you need to think about.
here's a little table of um, eggs, all uh, from the same species of cuckoo. On the left, you have the host species, and on the right, you have the cuckoo e egg that mimics it. And in some cases, you notice that the uh, mimicry is very good. I've already mentioned reed warbler. Um, reed warbler, that's a pretty reed warbler. Um, there's the med meadow pipit. Pied whitetail is pretty good. Dunnock is pathetic. Um, the, the, the cuckoo egg clearly is not a mimic of the, of the, of the dunnock. And, the, and the, the robin mimic is pretty bad too. Um, so that's the next thing to notice. Um, that not all um, cuckoos' egg mimicry is perfect. There are some species of host whose eggs are not so well mimicked as other species of, of host. So any cuckoo egg that you see in a meadow pipit nest is going to be a good mimic. Any cuckoo egg that you see in a dunnock nest is going to be a poor mimic. Hold that in your head. <coughs> Now I'm going to tell you a, an important fact which helps to reduce the puzzle a bit. Although I said that all these cuckoos are the same species, which is true, the females belong to what can be called a sort of different races. Um, uh, and, but, but because it's only the females, that's not a, re a very good word to use. Um, they're called gentes, the singular of which is gens, the Latin word gens, plural gentes. So there is a robin gens of cuckoo, there's a pied wagtail gens of cuckoo, a dunnock gens of cuckoo, and so on. So a, a female cuckoo only lays eggs in the nest appropriate to her gens. Female cuckoos, however, well, males don't have gentes. Males are not subdivided into gentes at all, um, and, fema and, and females of any gens can mate with um, the same males. Now, how do these gentes then uh, be separated? How can they be separated if they're all mating with the same males? Um, well, the answer's been known for a while. The answer is that uh, the female learns the nest of her own upbringing. So if, if a female is brought up by a robin, she remembers the nature of robin nests, and when, it's t when it comes time for her to lay her own eggs, she only lays eggs in robin nests. Similarly, pied wagtail cuckoos only lay um, eggs in pied wagtail nests because they remember the nest in which they were born. So these gentes are kind of cultural traditions. They're cultural in the sense that, they, uh, that they're, they're handed on from mother to daughter to granddaughter to great-granddaughter uh, by memory, by, 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 re by cultural tradition, by remembering. Um, it's rather like learn a language. You, you're brought up in a French-speaking household, so you learn French. You're brought up in a German-speaking ha household, so you learn German. Um, a cuckoo that's brought up in a Dunnock household learns Dunnock. But only females, because, because males don't, don't lay eggs at all, of course. Um, so males, in a sense, don't care who brought them up. They have no, no, no need to remember it. They're all, they're all just plain male cuckoos. But are we any closer to understanding uh, how it is that, um, that each gens of female cuckoo has the capacity to mimic only the species in which she's going to lay her eggs? And the, the, the exact answer is not known, but here's a very suggestive fact. Um, do you know about sex chromosomes? Who doesn't know about sex chromosomes? Do you, don't, don't be shy. I'm, I know you're not supposed to be a scientist, so there's no, absolutely no reason why you should. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll briefly say about sex chromosomes. Um, in mammals, um, 
sex determination is by a particular pair of chromosomes. Chromosomes, you know, are the little things that, the little thread-like things that are in every cell and which um, carry the genes. So um, <coughs> humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's 46 chromosomes in all. And most of them are, um, carry the genes that make our, give us our hair colour and our eye colour and our, and our intelligence and our musical ability and our skin colour and so on. Um, but there's a pair of very special chromosomes called the sex chromosomes, and then they're called X and Y. There's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and these determine your sex. Females in mammals have two Xs. They are XX. Males are XY. Um, so when... Uh, and so all, all eggs, you know, when you, when you make an egg or a sperm, when you make a, a gamete, it has only half the number of chromosomes. And so every egg has an X chromosome in it, has one X chromosome in, in it. But sperms, half of them have an X chromosome and half of them have a Y chromosome, because males are XY. So when a baby is made, uh, what determines whether it's going to be a boy or a girl is whether the sperm that fertilized the egg, whether the sperm was an X sperm or a Y sperm. And you can see that this mechanism achieves a 50-50 sex ratio. So all eggs are X eggs, half the sperms are X sperms, and half the sperms are Y sperms. And so 50% of the babies born are girls and 50% are boys. That's how it works in mammals. In birds, there's the same mechanism, but it's reversed. In birth, the male is the XX sex, and the female is the XY sex. So that means that eggs are, half of them are um, X eggs, and half of them are Y eggs. Um, and but sperms, they're all X. Now, think about the history of a Y chromosome. A Y chromosome in a mammal can look back on its ancestors and say, every single one of my ancestors was male. Okay? But an X chromosome can only say, um, two-thirds of my ancestors were female. In birds, it's the other way around. A Y chromosome can look back on its ancestors and say, every single one of my ancestors was female. Now we go back to the gentes of cuckoo, female cuckoo. Remember, a female cuckoo remembers the nest of her upbringing, and therefore there's, there are female traditions. There's a tradition of being a robin, a robin female or a dunnock female, etc. A Y chromosome in a robin cuckoo can look back on its ancestors. Not only are they all female, but they're all, for example, robin cuckoo females, or they're all dunnock cuckoo females, or they're all reed warbler cuckoo females. So if the genes that make egg colour are on the Y chromosome, we now have an explanation, we now can understand how it is that uh, each gens is, ca is capable of being a good mimic of the particular egg in which it finds it. Because it's had nothing but egg, but experience of that species of, of, of host. And it's hard to think of any other explanation. There's no de definite proof that this is the right explanation, but it's a very good explanation, and it would account for this, the ability of um, uh, cuckoos to mimic different species of um, host. Now, um, we have to presume that uh, these gentes are not for all time. I mean, that when I said grandmother, mother, daughter, granddaughter, great-granddaughter, all uh, remember the correct nest and therefore um, lay their eggs in, the, in the, the right kind of host, we have to presume that every now and again one makes a mistake. So, a um, we go back to, um, to that, that picture. 
um, we now can possibly make an, make an explanation for why, say, Dunnock cuckoos are rather bad at mim mimicry. Maybe the ancestor of the Dunnock cuckoos was a, let's say, a reed warbler cuckoo, which um, some generations back made a mistake and laid an egg in a Dunnock nest. <coughs> and there hasn't yet been time for uh, natural selection to have perfected the mimicry of the Dunnock gens of cuckoo. Uh, that again is speculation, but it's quite plausible. If that's true, and this is Nick Davis's own, own idea, if that's true, what it would mean is that, say, really good mimics like the meadow pipit gens of cuckoo have been at it a long time. The, these females have been parasitizing meadow pipit nests for a long time, and therefore there's been plenty of time for the, for the, the genes for mimicking meadow pipit eggs to have accumulated on the Y chromosomes of this gens of cuckoo. That's a plausible theory, but we, you might wish to think about other possible theories. Um, there is um, a cuckoo egg in a donut nest, and as you see, it's, an, it's not it's a pouring mimic. Um, one might have suggested that perhaps um, it's very difficult for cuckoos to make blue eggs. Uh, that's an, an, another possibility. But as against that, uh, in Scandinavia, cuckoos parasitize red starts. There's a cuckoo egg and red start eggs. And uh, that shows that cuckoos are perfectly capable of making blue eggs. So, that, so we, we can't resort to the explanation that cuckoos are incapable of uh, making blue. And in general, this is another general lesson, I would be suspicious, if I were you, of explanations that say the animal can't do something that it's somehow that it's genetically incapable of doing it. That should be an explanation of last resort. Well, Nick Davis himself uh, believes that, that we, what we're dealing with here is, is arms races again. Uh, and so the idea is that, uh, that meadow pipits and meadow pipit cuckoos have been running in an evolutionary arms race for rather a long time. And therefore, both of them have got good at what they do. The cuckoos, the cuckoo gens, has got good at mimicking meadow pipit eggs. And the meadow pipits have got good at um, discriminating and therefore forcing the cuckoos to get better and better. Whereas dunnocks and dunnocks and dunnock cuckoos have only just begun their arms race. Uh, and that's why um, they're probably neither of them very good at it. The cuckoos are no good at mimicking Dunnock eggs. And the Dunnocks are no good at discriminating um, against the cuckoos because they haven't been at the arms race long enough. There hasn't been enough time for either of them to have evolved uh, the adaptation they need against the other. So the idea... So the, what, what about this idea, then, that, 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 that the Dunnock arms race is very young? Um... Well, I just quoted Chaucer. Here's another Chaucer quote um, from the Parliament of Fowls in 1382, where Chaucer says, Thou motherer of the haste... I don't know, can anybody do Chaucer? You're all English scholars, are you? <laughs> um, I, 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 I can't do it, but anyway, you can read it there. Thou, thou murderer of the haste is an old English word for uh, hedge sparrow or duck on the branch that brought thee forth. Um, that shows that in 1382, cuckoos were already parasitizing <coughs> ducks. So the arms race, if it's young, is at least, goes back to 1382. Um, that's a fairly short time by evolutionary standards, but nevertheless, given that the generation time is only a year or so, um, uh, I think I would expect. I mean, that that makes me a, a bit doubtful about the idea that it's that the um, arms race is all that young. 
Um, because, um, what's that, about 600 years, more, a little bit more than 600 years, um, that's a pretty long time um, for, um, for an animal whose generation time is only a year or so. Um, so another possibility, which I think is worth thinking about, you remember I said that there's a Dunnock gens, and that the Dunnock gens probably came into existence when, some, when an individual female of another gens made a mistake uh, and laid an egg in the wrong kind of nest. Um, and that, I'm sure, is plausible. Um, what if there's more than one Dunnock gens? I mean, there's no reason why um, there should be... Uh, an, an, there's no reason why there shouldn't be an old mistake and a young mistake, so to speak. And it may be that in Chaucer's time, it was a different gens of cuckoo that was uh, laying eggs in, in Dunnock nests. Uh, and so it may be that the... Um, that the Dunnocks we see now, um, who, who seem to be right at the beginning of their arms race, really are at the beginning of their, of their arms race. And the Chaucer quote from 1382 is irrelevant because it was a different gens of, uh, of, of female cuckoos. Now, Nick Davis and uh, his colleague Michael Brook have done some experiments uh, to test the, their arms race theory <coughs> experimentally. Um, and it's an important lesson that if you, if you can do experiments, it's a very good thing to do because then you control the variables that matter. Davis and Brook played the role of cuckoo and planted eggs in other birds' nests to see what would happen, to see whether the other birds threw them, threw them out. And they used the words acceptors and rejectors. They found that some species of bird in which they dumped eggs uh, were acceptors. They sat on the eggs quite happily. Others were rejectors. They threw the eggs out. So the interesting question was, which species of bird are acceptors and which species are rejectors? You would expect that those species which are um, vulnerable to cuckoos in one way or another would be um, would be rejectors uh, because they've evolved um, that habit. Well, birds like uh, the ones you see there, greenfinches, linnets, bullfinches, whatever that is, um, <laughs> I don't know what it is, I don't. Um, uh, birds that, that feed on seeds, finches particularly, um, are not vulnerable to being parasitized by cuckoos because, they, uh, because their food, seeds, is not suitable for baby cuckoos. And so cuckoos don't parasitize them. And uh, these um, were acceptors. There's never been any selection pressure on them to reject cuckoo eggs because they've never been parasitized by cuckoos. Cuckoos have never attempted to lay their eggs in the nests of seed eaters. But Birds like uh, chaffinches and blackbirds and thrushes are vulnerable to cuckoos. Um, they feed their young on what cuckoos need, on the same kind of food as baby cuckoos need. And they are rejectors, which again gives support to the arms race theory. There's another category of birds which, as far as diet is concerned, you would expect to be vulnerable to cuckoos because they feed their young on the same kind of food as baby cuckoos need. But they nest in holes uh, like that, so, um, or, like, or like tits, so um, cuckoos can't get in. So they're safe from, from cuckoos. And once again, they turn out to be acceptors. They did not reject the eggs that Davies and Brooke uh, dumped in their nests. Uh, and pine flycatchers is a good example, and that's one, the one that they, 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 that they tested. Um, spotted flycatchers, however, unlike pine flycatchers, spotted flycatchers 
um, have similar diets to baby cuckoos, and they don't have home nests. They have, they have open nests, which are accessible to cuckoos. And sure enough, when Davis and Brooke dumped eggs in spotted flycatcher nests, uh, the flycatchers rejected them. They are, that, again, fits with the arms race theory. So um, that's the conclusion of the cuckoo story that I want to tell you. Uh, and um, just to sort of summarize the, the, the general points that I've been trying to make along the way, uh, neither the cuckoo nor the host need be thought of as knowing what's going on or why it's doing it. Think of them as little robots, little clockwork robots, programmed by their genes, working through the processes of embryology to perform actions which, on average, if present environments resemble past environments, ancestral environments, um, are calculated to aid survival and reproduction. And that's, in general, what we expect animals to do. We expect animals to have what can be called instincts, behavior patterns which, they, which are performed mechanically, without cognition, without knowledge of why they're doing it. And they're doing it because their ancestors did it and survived because they did it and passed on the genes that made them do it. So um, things like um, feed squawking, gaping things in your nest, in general, can be said to improve the survival of the genes that program brains to feed squawking, gaping things in your nest. So those genes survive. Uh, and any animal, anywhere, um, can be seen doing things which you can say, on average, are calculated to be improving its survival, more generally the survival of its genes in reproduction. And that is true even of the foster parents like this wretched reed warbler um, feeding a monstrous baby cuckoo. Um, that is true in general because uh, in general the rule of thumb, feed gaping things in your nest or gaping things that have outgrown your nest, um, in general, that works. That works to, to make baby reed warblers. The fact that in this particular case it's making a baby cuckoo is an unfortunate mistake. It's an error. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blunder um, exploited by or engineered by the cuckoo. Um, why did that mistake not get eliminated by natural selection? Why... Uh, has the arms race, in this case, apparently ended in victory for the cuckoo? Well, one possible explanation is what's been called the rare enemy effect. Um, if you think about it, every one of the ancestors of that cuckoo has succeeded in fooling a host. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. Every single one of the ancestors of that, of that cuckoo, at least going back to before they became cuckoos at all, um, has succeeded. They have to succeed. Um, the, the, whereas, if you look at the ancestors of the reed warbler, it may be only a small minority of them have ever met a cuckoo. So plenty of the genes in that reed warbler have come through generations in which they never met a cuckoo. That's the rare enemy effect. If the chances of being parasitized by cuckoo is relatively low, then making a mistake on the rare occasions when a cuckoo does parasitize your nest is not so serious. But getting it wrong if you're a cuckoo, failing to, to, to do what cuckoos do, if, if you are a cuckoo, is certain death. Um, so there's an asymmetry in the risk of failure. There's an asymmetry in the cost of failure. Uh, it's related to what's been called the, the life dinner principle. Um, Aesop's fables, you know Aesop's fables. Um, in one of Aesop's fables, uh, the rabbit runs faster than the fox because the rabbit is running for his life while the fox is only running for his dinner. Once again, there's an asymmetry of, of risk. The cost of failure, the cost of not managing to outrun the fox if you're a rabbit is death. The cost of Failing to outrun the rabbit if you're a fox is just a 
bit of hunger until you have another shot at another rabbit. Um, so the, the asymmetry of failure um, may be one explanation for why um, the, this particular arms race seems to have ended up with this rather absurd asymmetry with the cuckoo that any human can look at that and immediately say, don't be such a stupid reed warbler, can't you see that that's, a, that's obviously not a baby reed warbler? And I suppose the, the, gro- the grotesque magnitude of the error serves to emphasise once more that it is a mechanical, robotic thing, not a cognitive thing. Yes, questions, yes. When does the cuckoo leave the nest? Sorry? When does the cuckoo leave the nest, the other bird? When does the cuckoo yeah. leave? Oh, um, he leaves the nest at roughly the same time as, as, as the ordinary bird, as, as any, any bird would. Does anything cause it to leave? Because like, obviously it should just keep... Well, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's got to go and, 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 uh, and, and earn yeah. its own living insofar as, um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a female finding another... Actually, cuckoos migrate. I mean, it's, it, it leaves and goes, goes to Africa. And that, that's a whole, whole other story. Um... But no, I mean, it's, it's not going to stay there forever. Um, and also, the, the, the parent bird probably wouldn't go on feeding it forever either. Yes? Um, is, it, is it possible for a chicken to lay two eggs in its host's nest? Sorry, is it possible for, for a chicken to lay two eggs, two cuckoo eggs? Well, the they don't. Um, I, I don't know why they don't. Um, uh, it, it, it would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And there, there must be some, I would think there must be some economic reason why they, why they don't do that. Yes. Um, does the population of cuckoos in any given habitat a lot smaller than the host Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the the, the, rare, the rare enemy effect is is, is plausible. The cuckoos are getting very rare now. Um, uh, did, h- how many of you have actually heard heard a cuckoo calling? Um, I mean, there, there was a time when you could not go out into the country without without hearing them. Um, but but they're, they're, I'm not sure why that is. Why is it that only the cuckoos can develop this mechanism of survivalism? Well, um, as I said, there are some other species that do it. There are some in Africa that do it. Um, there are some in, in America that, that, that do it. Um, there are some birds that do it within their own species. There are some ducks where a female will lay a few eggs in other females' nests before she lays a proper clutch in her own in, in her own, and that may be how the evolutionary habit got started. Um, it's one of those things where if, 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 if everybody did it, it, it couldn't work, of course. There's, they've got to be... Um, it, 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 it only works given that a majority of birds are honest nesters. Um, if, they, if, 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 if everybody was a brood parasite, there'd be, there'd be nobody to... And it's quite a... It's an interesting mathematical question, actually why that doesn't happen, one that we might come on to. Um, in, in, I'm giving two more lectures in the spring, and I, I might mention something about the mathematics of game theory there. Um, any more questions on cuckoos before I move on? Okay. And I'm going to change gear completely and try to give you a very, very swift coverage of the complete history of life. Um, and um, I'm going to do it in an unconventional way rather than starting at the beginning and going on to the end and then stopping um, I'm going to start at the end and work backwards and there is a reason for this Um, there is a common error in the portrayal of evolution which is that it is aimed at a climax which is humans um, we are a vain species, and we tend to regard ourselves as evolution's last. Thank you, as evolution's last word. And so, the idea of a sort of ladder of, of, of you, you often see it in the form of a series of monkeys and apes, sort of increasing size as you advance forward. Um, and that's a, a rather pernicious error because, of course, um, what evolution really is is a branching tree, and all modern animals and plants are of equal status, are they, they are the end products, the temporary, the present end products, the twigs at the ends of the tree. And um, the, what's down there is all dead and extinct. Um, so given that that's a, a, the true picture of what's happening in evolution, um, 
you could start at the beginning and go on to any of these things as the climax. You could go up and on and end up as a ladybird as the climax of evolution, or the cactus as the climax of evolution, or the fish as the climax of evolution. There's no reason why you should regard humans as the climax. But we are human, and we're interested in humans, and so there is some reason for tracing our own ancestry, because we, we care about our own ancestry more than the ancestry of ladybirds. And so the way I've chosen to do it is to work backwards and to start with humans and then go backwards through time, meeting these other branches as we meet them with other modern animals. So as you go backwards in time, the first cousin, well, all the time we're meeting cousins, um, the first cousin we meet are the chimpanzees and bonobos. Can you see, is this, far, is this visible? Is, this, is the screen big enough to see? No. Uh, so um, I'm going to be showing you lots of pictures of this form. And so I, I, I need to point out how, how these pictures work. We're going to be going backwards. That, there's time naught. And there's time one million years ago, two million years ago, etc. And as we go backwards, we, we are meeting um, branch points. And the first branch point we meet is the branch point of the chimpanzees. And the branch occurred six million years ago. So six million years ago, a species split in half. And one branch went off that way, and another branch went off that way, actually, on this bit, many, many other times on the way. But I'm only concerned with the, the splits that give rise to still surviving species. So this branch number one is six million years ago, and it gave rise to another branch about two million years ago, when the chimpanzees went one way and bonobos went the other way. That's what bonobos are sometimes called pygmy chimpanzees, um, and they're characterized by the fact that they do everything by sex. Um, bonobos um, use copulation to settle male-male disputes, female-female disputes, may, I mean, um, interactions between babies and ad adults. It's all done by copulation. Um, so that's, that's branch point number one. And I'm going to now go back through time. It's always going to be the same kind of picture. Seven million years into the past, this line here is now everything that's already joined. Do you see what I mean? So that's now the humans and the chimpanzees and bonobos. And they branched off from gorillas seven million years ago. And now we can think of the chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas as joining forces and going on back through time. Do you see what I'm doing here? Back to 14 million years ago, a branch with orangutans. So the already joined ones are chimpanzees, bonobos and humans. They come down there and then they branch off from um, orangutans or orangutans. Those are not orangutans out there, by the way. Those are the common ancestor of orangutans and chips, bonobos and humans. So you, you can see that we are that that a, that a chimpanzee is a closer cousin to a human than it is to a gorilla or an orangutan. They're all in that branch there, as opposed to orangutans there, 40 million years ago. Um, these these datings are I'm I'm portraying them as more accurate than I should. Um, these are all plus or minus a fairly large margin of error. Those those datings. Um, nowadays, datings are mostly based upon um, partly molecular evidence and fossil evidence, where fossils are dated by radiometric methods. I ought to say a little bit about that. Um, when an igneous rock, volcanic rock, is formed, the moment when the, the lava of the, the molten rock cools and crystallizes is a very significant moment. And it's the moment when you can say that the clock of radioactive decay of certain isotopes is zeroed. Um, I won't go into the physics of that, but 
Um, you can tell how old a, a bit of rock is, if it's igneous rock, if it's volcanic rock, by looking at how much of a certain radioactive isotope has decayed. And these are, again, plus or minus a margin of error. And there are various different radioactive clocks. There's, there's carbon dating, there's potassium argon dating, there's uranium dating, and so on. There are about a dozen separate radioactive clocks whereby you can date um, either rock, and the carbon dating separate, so leave that out on one side. Normally it's igneous rocks. You can date igneous rocks by looking at these radioactive clocks. And uh, there are, as I say, about a dozen of them. And insofar as they overlap, they agree with each other. So we've got a pretty good handle on how old a piece of solid granite or something is. Um, fossils don't appear in igneous rock for fairly obvious reasons. Um, fossils appear in sedimentary rock, which is an entirely different kind of rock laid down by layer upon layer upon layer of mud or sand or silt um, falling in water on top of each other and then eventually hardening and, and solidifying. Um, so you can't date fossils directly or, or the best you can do is to look for a piece of igneous rock that's near the fossil, preferably um, sandwiching a, a, a sedimentary bed. So if you've got a bit of igneous rock there, another bit of igneous rock there, and a fossil in between, then you know the fossil's age is between this age and this, and this age. Um, so that's partly how fossils are... Um, are, are that is how fossils are dated. Um, and the, these branch points are then dated by um, molecular means, which enables you to say um, how many uh, genetic changes have taken place along these branches. You literally compare the DNA, you, compare, you count the number of letters that they have, have changed, so you get a, a, an, a closeness of cousinship quantitative estimate of the closeness of cousinship of any two animals whose blood you can take, modern animals. And then in those cases where you have a good handle on, the, on exactly when the branch point occurred, you actually have a fossil, which you think is a, is a, good, a good candidate for the time of the common ancestor. You can calibrate your molecular clock uh, using the radiometric dating of fossils. So that, that, that's how it's done. But as I say, there is a margin of error. The next branch point, 18 uh, million years ago, we have the already joined great apes, that's orangutans, gorillas, chips, bonobos, and humans, is, is all those there. And this is where the gibbons branch off. And then the gibbons branch again and again uh, at the, these various times here to produce these modern types of gibbon. Gibbons, you know, these smaller great apes, smaller apes, not great apes, smaller apes, Apes, apes have no tail, uh, and they're as opposed to monkeys. The next branch point, 25 million years ago, that's all the apes, including great apes and gibbons, and this is the old world monkeys, the monkeys of Africa and Asia, branching various times there. Going backwards in time, 40 million years ago, that's all the apes and old world monkeys, and this is the new world monkeys, the monkeys of uh, South America. Uh, and they again branch into various types. Um, the monkeys of South America, well, all monkeys have tails, and the monkeys of South America um, are particularly good with prehensile tails, that's tails that they can, that act as a sort of fifth leg, a fifth, a fifth arm that they can wrap around trees. 58 million years ago, that's all the monkeys and apes there, and now this is a rather small group of animals, the tarsiers, um, which are rather beautiful creatures with gigantic eyes. Um, I'll have to move a bit more swiftly, I think, now. Um, 63 million years ago, lemurs, found only in Madagascar. Uh, when um, Madagascar split off from Africa, it had a cargo 
of ancestral primates, uh, and the ones in Madagascar gave rise to lemurs, and the ones that, left, that were left behind in Africa gave rise to uh, monkeys. And there was a remarkably rich, diverse fauna of lemurs in Madagascar. Um, some of it now extinct. There were even lemurs as big as a gorilla. 70 million years ago, colligos and cree shrews, um, don't need to worry about them too much. Um, 75 million years ago, an important branch point, rabbits and rodents. So that's all the ones that have already joined, namely apes, monkeys, tarsiers, lemurs, um, uh, tree shrews, and um, uh, flying lemurs, which are so-called um, colligos. And then at uh, 75 million years ago, this major branch, which gave rise to rabbits and hares on, on that branch there, and gave rise to rodents there. Rodents are gigantic uh, family of mammals. And the rodents even included in not just rats and the familiar things. In South America, now extinct, there were giant rodents, giant guinea pigs in effect. Uh, a giant guinea pig the size of a small rhinoceros. And not that small either. 85 million years ago, another gigantic branch. That's everything so far mentioned is there. And then here, this very large group, which includes uh, both carniv carnivorous animals like dogs, cats, lions, and bears, um, and um, uh, ungulates like um, cattle and antelopes and horses, it included bats, it included oh, all sorts of things. Um, that's a very, very major branch. 95 million years ago, Eden takes uh, these, uh, these are South American mammals. Um, that's an, there's an anti giant anteater, armadillo, sloth. There were giant sloths, sort of tall as this room, again, unfortunately, extinct, uh, exclusively South American. 105 million years ago, Afrotheus. This is a, a large group again uh, of animals that originated. Yes, yeah, sorry. Why did all the really large animals go extinct? Oh, um, it, I don't think that's really true. But but one one reason would be, I suppose, that they um, they tend to have smaller numbers. Um, Afrotheus uh, include elephants, aardvarks, dugongs, and manatees, um, and very smaller animals. Um, like elephant shrews, ten wrecks. 140 million years ago, this big divide between everything that we've already talked about, which is sort of our kind of mammals, so-called placental mammals, and marsupials. Uh, we think of marsupials as being mostly confined to Australia, but they were more widespread. And uh, they were widespread in South America, and there still are some in South America, there are possums and, and things like that in South America. Um, those, those are all, they're all Australian, those ones there. And the, the remarkable thing about the Australian fauna is that the marsupials diversified to produce very much the same kind of range of mammals as we get in the rest of the world, applying the same kind of trades. Um, so um, you have marsupial rabbits and marsupial mice and marsupial moles and marsupial flying squirrels and things, and they independently evolved those ways of life, which is a beautiful example of convergent evolution, yeah. What is the definition of marsupial? Well, the, the, I'm not sure about definition, but um, the most re easily recognizable characteristic is they have a pouch. Uh, and um, I don't know whether you can see to any of these, but um, the, the baby kangaroo would be in, in, a, in a pouch that's carried about, and it can hop out of the pouch and then hop back in again. Um, so they're born extremely young. They're born as really just little jelly-like embryos. And then they crawl up. Uh, the, the, the mother licks a pathway um, from the vaginal opening up to the pouch. And the little tiny embryo kind of crawls up this wetted pathway into the pouch um, where it finds a teat to, to latch onto. And it grows and it becomes big enough to, to, to leap out of the pouch 
And so it, it goes through a stage when it's a little, it's called a jelly, in the case of a kangaroo, um, and it leaps back into the pouch when, whenever it wants to. Um, 180 million years ago, the monotremes, these are egg-laying mammals. So they, they, they date from, from way back at, at a time when probably all mammals laid eggs. And then this lot, which is the one we've already seen, became live bearers in two different ways. Marsupials one way, descent the other way. But the, these rather rare, not, not rare, but, but, but rather few species uh, of um, Australian and New Guinea uh, mammals, duckbill platypus and spiny anteater, um, still lay eggs. Uh, 310 million years ago, the animals that we conventionally call reptiles, um, so including birds and dinosaurs, um, so turtles, snakes, lizards, dinosaurs, and but birds are dinosaurs. Yes. Why are the majority of the last two groups, monotremes and the marsupials, predominantly found in Australia? Why? What? Sorry. Why are those last two groups, monotremes and marsupials? So found in Australia, but nowhere else. Oh, no, I, I think that's coincidence. I mean, I think it, it just happens. What, what happened was that um, uh, bit, uh, uh, around 100 million years ago, or a little bit late, later, um, the great southern continent of Gondwana um, split up. There was a huge southern continent, which, which is, is now consists, which consisted of the bits that we now call Africa, Australia, South America, um, Antarctica, Madagascar, and India. Um, they were all part of one huge continent, and, they, and it split apart. This phenomenon of continental drift, a phenomenon of plate tectonics, and carried with them their, the cargo of whatever was living at the time. And no doubt there were monotremes on all those parts, so separate parts, but they only survived in, in Australia. 340 million years ago, amphibians, so that there is all the mammals, birds, dinosaurs, reptiles along that line, and now this is a branch of the amphibians, salamanders, frogs, and Sicilians. Four hundred and seventeen million years ago, everything we've already talked about, and the branch of lungfish which survive as three or four uh, species. Um, that's one of them. Um, so that is a closer cousin to you than it is to a, to a normal fish. A little bit earlier, 425 million years ago, everything so far branched off from common ancestor with coelacanths. Coelacanths were long known as fossils, but they have been thought to be extinct uh, from about the time when the dinosaurs went extinct. But then, very excitingly, in the 1930s, a South African fishing boat fished one up. And um, it was brought to the attention of a fish expert called J.L.B. Smith, who went to see it, and he was absolutely dumbfounded. He said, I would not have been more surprised if I'd seen a dinosaur walking down the street. Um, he was almost paralyzed with emotion when, when he saw it. And since then, Half a dozen or so have, have, been, have been found. Next branch, 440 million years ago, this gigantic branch of conventional fishes, ray fin fishes, the ordinary sort of fishes that you eat, um, which are extremely diverse. Uh, and they include things like seahorses as well as more fish like creatures. 460 million years ago, sharks and rays, had to race now. Um, 530 million years ago, jawless fish. Everything so far has had jaws. <coughs> and these fish are jawless fish. Uh, they have a sort of sucker instead. And, we and our ancestors presumably did. I leave that out. Um, I'll go right swiftly through this. Um, We're now getting so far into the past that it's too unreliable to actually put dates on it. But certainly well, well over um, half a billion years ago, um, everything we've seen so far 
branched off from the ancestors of echinoderms, which are starfish, sea urchins, etc. And then, again, we can't date it ac accurately, but um, we do know that all these invertebrates, all these worms, snails, um, uh, arthropods, insects, spiders, crabs, and so on, they're all more closely related to each other than they are to us, where us means everything I've said so far, including sea urchins and, and, and starfish, etc. So we are closer cousins to starfish than we are to any of that part. Uh, leave that out. Um, way, way into the past, we branched off from jellyfish, um, sea anemones, and so on. Tina Fors, need bother about them, except they are astonishingly beautiful, live in the sea. That's called Venus's girdle. They have these lovely shimmering rainbow patterns. Sponges, never mind about them. Bungie. Yes, you can laugh. <laughs> um, uh, fun fungi are, are more closely related to us, to, to, uh, to animals, than they are to plants. Amoebas, plants. So we're, every time I click on a slide, we're, we're, we're looking at a more distant cousin of ourselves, or rather a great bunch of more distant cousins of ourselves, closer cousins to each other than they are to the rest of us. So that's everything we've seen so far, including fungi, and that's, and that's plants. Various odds and ends. Um, things that were once thought to be bacteria, but are now called archaea, which is different. Um, and then finally, true bacteria. Um, so just to put us in our place, um, that's a very, very partial plot of the whole living kingdoms. And it's, it's a family tree that's been wrapped around on itself, in order, just simply in order to fit in the space of one, of one page. But you can unravel it there and un unwrap it. And so each of these branches gives rise to a new, a new um, uh, sub-branch. And round the outside here, this little, little whiskery fringe, is modern species um, which um, include us. There's us there. And if you think that's a complete set, you're wrong. This is a tiny subset. If I'm, I'm going to blow up now just that little bit there. And you see... This is humans there, and all the rest of them, apes and monkeys and things, have been left out of this diagram. The nearest relatives we managed to fit on this picture, this little fringy picture, that, that's the fringe you were just looking at. The nearest relatives are mice and rats. Um, and so there's, you can see how even this, even this whiskery fringe around, around the edge is a very, very partial. Uh, list of the divergence of evolution. And I will stop there and see you in 2014. Any more questions?